let's say you wanted to create a firm uh, that would never fail. Uh, one thing you could do is simply have require it to have no debt. A uh, second thing you could do, a little bit less restrictive, is to limit it to having non-recourse debt. Um, a third thing you could do is allow it to have both secured and unsecured uh, debt that has recourse both to the assets posted as collateral and to a claim on a fixed number of shares uh, in, the, um, uh, in the company. Um, and the company can always print up those shares, much like a country that borrows in its own currency can always print up the currency necessary to make sure it doesn't default on its own currency uh, debt. So what we do is design a, uh, a security meant to serve the role in a system like that of uh, the unsecured debt with recourse that is only to equity, and we call those securities uh, equity recourse notes. Okay, so equity recourse notes are bail-inable debt with key differences from the existing uh, COCOs. Let me turn on my microphone here. There we go. Okay, so uh, the main uh, differences, I would say, the main important conceptual differences are that conversion of any given issue, issue is based on a percentage, for example, 25% of the share price on the date that a bond is issued. A company could issue ERNs with a higher percentage conversion price, but not with a lower one. And uh, the second difference is that conversion takes place payment at a time instead of the entire bond converting at once. So here's an example of how um, an, an earn would work. Let's say a bond is issued when the share price is 80, and on a particular date, there's a payment of $1,000 due, and that payment could be principal or interest. Um, so the repayment can be, there could be two possibilities. Uh, if the share price is less than $20, so the share price is less than 25% of what it was on the date of um, issuance of the bond, the bank pays 1,000 divided by 20 <coughs> equals uh, 50 shares uh, in lieu of interest. So one way of thinking about uh, the payment is that uh, what the bondholder bought was a riskless payment of $1,000 short a put option of 50 shares at $20 uh, a share. Very simple uh, European put option. The second possibility is if the share price is greater than $20, uh, the bank will normally pay $1,000 in cash. If it turns out that you know, they're, they're Enron and they, they, they don't really have the money, they can pay 50 shares instead, but we wouldn't really expect many people uh, to do that. Um, if the share price is below $20 on one particular payment date, but then it rises above $20 by the next payment date, then the next payment can be made in cash again. So we only deal with things on a payment by payment basis rather than ever converting uh, the entire uh, bond. And we'll talk about why we do that a bit later. So to compare earns with the COCOs we currently see, one important difference is that we're basing things on market capital rather than regulatory capital. So I think by this time, seven or eight years after the financial crisis hit its peak, we all know many of the problems with regulatory capital. I'll present one slide with, which talks about some, but we all know that all of the firms, all of the major firms that went bust, went bust while they were still rated as, having, as being well capitalized by their uh, uh, their regulators, um, some of them even passed a uh, stress test just a month or two before they went bust. Um, regulatory capital is pretty manipulable. Regulators may in bad times feel uh, pressured to forbear on uh, uh, taking, uh, on forcing banks to uh, report losses. 
earns because they're based on the stupid market price are much less um, manipulable. Um, for that reason also, conversion of earns don't send a signal beyond what's already in the share price. If it's regulatory capital and the regulator thinks that th things are so bad that they finally cause the bank to take a write down, that's a signal to the market that things are really bad and there's going to be pressure for the regulator to not do that. Whereas with the urn, the market just went down and there's no information in the conversion other than what was already in the market price. So there's no pressure from the idea that you're creating a bad signal by forcing a conversion. And we think that makes the credibility uh, uh, <clears throat> of earns as growing, going concern capital much greater. I think the way most people currently think of existing regulatory COCOs is they're bail-inable capital. The idea is to tell people if you buy this kind of bond and the bank goes bust, you're going to lose your money. But there's much less clarity on whether you're going to lose money if the bank doesn't go bust. We'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens with the existing uh, uh, COCOs. And uh, we think, therefore, the political uh, uh, changes to any political changes to delay a conversion are much more transparent with earns. You have to really change the, uh, uh, the terms if it's a market price term rather than something subtle like the, the rate at which you cause write down. Just one slide that I'm particularly fond of on regulatory capital. Um, I think sometimes it's worth just reminding people that even though the Fed will go in and tell you, you know, we did a much better job of regulating than uh, uh, the SEC. We had 150 people in Citibank. They only had two people in, you know, Lehman Brothers or, you know, Merrill Lynch or whoever. Uh, the reality is, when you think about regulating capital values, um, you know, what's, uh, other than avoiding fraud, what's more important than the way you force people to mark their securities? And let's just compare the way people like Bank of America and Citigroup, who were regulated by the Fed, how they were marking their securities, the same kind of securities, um, against, uh, say, Lehman Brothers, who in turn were less conservative than, you know, were obviously not conservative enough by far, not as conservative as Morgan Stanley, who in turn were not as conservative as Goldman Sachs. And, and, and what do you have here? Bank of America taking on its commercial real estate losses of 4% while Lehman was taking 15%. Lehman marking its subprime CDOs at uh, half the level of Wachovia Bank, even at the same time, twice the level of uh, uh, Morgan Stanley. Um, Lehman marking its uh, Alt-A securities at half the level of Citibank. So, I mean, the one thing we know about the regulatory capital numbers, particularly from the commercial banks, I mean, they weren't real numbers. And, pardon me? This was um, 2008, summer 2008. Okay. So just just some more on on earns versus cocos. Um, Payment at a time conversion, which I'll come back to yet again a little bit later, uh, versus all at once conversion, it means that things are happening more gradually. So if you think of the political system as only kind of responding to crises, you know, we'll deal with global warming when New York City is two feet underwater, et cetera, um, there's no sense of doing anything until the crisis is sufficiently bad that it becomes politically less advantageous to not. If you have payment at time conversion, which is gradual, which is creating cash as it goes on, uh, which will be the third point on this slide, there's much less of an incentive for a regulator, I think, to jump in and uh, stop something from happening. Whereas if you have a conversion of an entire bond, uh, it, it's a little bit different because, you know, you convert the entire bond, you don't actually raise any cash for the bank. Um, why not find a way to delay that? 
Um, with an earn, what happens is every time a payment is converted, you're automatically saving at least $1 cash. Um, for every dollar of equity, you're effectively forcing the bank to sell. So in our previous example, let's say the stock is at $15. What you're effectively doing when you force a conversion of a given payment is the bank is directly saving $20 of cash for every share that it's issuing, and the shares are you know, $15. So it's selling stock at $20 a share. Whereas when you convert an entire bond at once, you know, you could have a 20-year bond. You convert it, you might not be saving any cash right away on the day of the conversion. And so you're not really solving any kind of cash flow problem in conversion in proportion to the amount of conversion. And that creates more pressure, I think, to, to find a way to not convert. Now, relative to market cocos, the advantage of payment at a time is that you eliminate what some people call the multiple equilibrium uh, a problem. So one way to think about that is let's say the price of the bond was down to, uh, the price of the stock was down to uh, $21 a share, and you were a, an earn holder. Uh, if the entire bond was going to create at one time, if the stock ever twist, hit 20, uh, then you would say, you know, if I can just sell short the stock, push it down to 20, there'll be a conversion, and then I will share in the upside as well as the downside. So just in case we're at the bottom, I will benefit by the upside if I force the conversion. On the other hand, um, if I don't have the conversion, I still get the downside, because if the stock ends up below 20, I, I still take the loss, but I don't get the upside if it turns out that 21 was the bottom. So you get close enough to the conversion price, and there's an incentive for people to sell short when you convert the entire bond. You don't have that problem in uh, payment at a time conversion. Another advantage, I think, of earns is that they are countercyclical in the following way. So let's say the share price goes from 80 to 40, and the bank is issuing some new earns. So now the conversion price, instead of being 20, would be 10, because 25% of 40 uh, is 10. What does that mean? It means the new earn holders won't lose any money until the stock gets down to 10. That is, they won't lose money until the old bonds have lost 50%. So what happens is that the old bondholders lose seniority when the new bondholders, when the new bonds are issues, issued. And just as an arithmetic matter, that means shareholders gain. If you're um, uh, making the old bondholders worse off, I could use a more colorful word, then uh, you must be uh, making the shareholders uh, better off, assuming the new bondholders are getting a, a fair deal. So it's the reverse of the usual dead overhang argument where we say when things are bad, uh, we'd like a bank to repair its balance sheet by issuing uh, new equity. It doesn't want to issue new equity because it's so dilutive. What do we mean by dilutive? It means when we issue the new equity, we, some of that goes to protect the old bondholders. Um, here we get the opposite um, result. And I actually think uh, th this is a good thing. And one of the reasons is you, you, know, you have to remember that really in a rational market, uh, we might well expect banks to haircut bank assets by a higher percentage when collateral falls. It's not something where the, you know, the market is going crazy. That, it makes sense. Um, so, for example, let's say you have a mor let's say the bank owns mortgages. So let's say the original mortgage, they lent $100 against an asset worth 120 And then the bank tries to borrow against that mortgage. If you were, or a hedge fund tries to borrow against that mortgage if they own it. So if the lender was preparing, say, for 20% loss, they would say, well, the asset's worth 120, 20% 20 loss gets you down to 96. The asset's worth 100, 
but I have to be prepared for it to go down to 96, so I'll lend 96, they have to put up four in cash. Now let's say you've got that same mortgage, it's still got a face value of 100, but the asset has gone down to 60. The house has gone down 50% in value. Now the mortgage holder effectively owns the house. The mortgage is really worth 60, even though the face value is 100. And then you say, well, what happens uh, if a lender says, I have to be prepared for a 20% decline? The lender says 20% of 60 is 12. I have to be prepared for the value to go to 48. I have to require 12 uh, in equity uh, rather than four in equity. So it kind of makes sense that you might have a situation where as the value of assets that serve as collateral for bank loans fall, that the market might demand that the bank actually raise not just enough equity to make up for its losses, which you know, never happened in the, the, uh, the crisis because of the regulatory system, but also even, even a bit more of that because inherently their assets may become uh, more risky. Um, there's a whole other issue of maybe when those assets become more risky, they ought to be selling them to hedge funds because uh, they may not, no longer be the natural holders of the asset. But the regulatory system, again, discourages that the way it exists. So we think earns have an advantage by being counter-cyclical. Um, our idea of the long-run ideal uh, bank capital structure um, would be something like this. You, you could envision banks offering guaranteed money market funds and um, non-guaranteed prime funds to depositors. And the prime funds uh, would be marked to market like ultra short bond funds. But people would understand that they could take a loss on those. So let's say if you, know, you had a bond fund which uh, you had deposits. If we had, a, if we had a prime money market funds with $100 a share, asset values, what would happen is that occasionally somebody would see that for every $100 they had last month, they were down to $99.86. Some months they'd go up to $100.23. I think if people saw those things happening and we had adjustments as we went along, um, they, would not be, uh, uh, they would not be crises. Certainly there'd be no incentive to remove money as, the way, as there was in reserve fund. Um, firms regarded as uh, SIFIs would, so that we separating out this issue that we're, we're not allowing certain liabilities to fail and we're not also allowing certain firms to fail. If we don't allow your firm to fail, you'd have to be funded with equity, earn like bonds, and secure debt with recourse only to earns and equity. And, you, you can do similar things with things like derivatives and loan commitments and so forth. In the short run, you might envision a capital structure uh, that looks a little bit more like the kind of thing that Bank of England has sometimes talked about where you might have a, but not exactly, but where you might have a subsidiary which includes equity and deposits and hopefully simple to value assets. In the long run, you know, I'd like those assets to be as simple as possible. So to the extent that we provided insurance for deposits, uh, it would be as uh, uncostly as possible. And then you'd have uh, essentially the rest of the bank. <clears throat> Why not just more equity rather than something not very fancy, but uh, a, a fancier than more equity, why, why have uh, uh, earns? You know, uh, the obvious kind of reasons are things like agnosticism about Medigliani-Miller, which after all is a complete markets model and banks are essentially an incomplete markets uh, an institution. So there's agnosticism about that. There's countercyclicality of earns. But I think really the more important thing is what makes the current banking system complicated? Is it that a bank has equity versus if it has equity and earns? No. That's like saying what makes the tax system complicated is that we have seven brackets instead of five. That's not it. What makes the banking system complicated is that we got Basel III. 
which is huge. We've got banks that are motivated to have a thousand subsidiaries. You know, if you can move to a more market-based system, you can have things much simpler. People think about, uh, uh, you know, before the crisis, there were all these regulators who were worried about hedge funds because they weren't regulated. Well, they were regulated, it's just they were regulated by the market in terms of their capital requirements. And, you know, that, that, that kind of worked well. So, fundamentally, we think that earns are a way, without doing too much violence, to move us to a system uh, that is, uh, that creates a simple, more market-based uh, 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 regulatory capital system where the requirements on banks would be uh, closer to the requirements that banks you know, apply to their, uh, to their own uh, customers. Um, so here's some concluding remarks. Um, I'll just say, why don't I think earns exist right now? If I had to say, I'd say three things. One is, if you thought about regular firms, people might say, if you have regular hard debt, as opposed to soft debt like earns, regular debt's a better uh, monitoring device. I, I'm, you know, I'm sure that's true. To that extent, earns are second best and that we're taking as a constraint the fact that we're not gonna let these firms go out or we're gonna have them go out with a whimper as would happen with earns rather than with a bank. Uh, the second thing is the tax law. I think that as designed currently, there's a big question as to whether companies would be able to deduct the interest on earns and they might have to be modified in some way to try to deal with that. But if it's a regulatory issue, banks are gonna, con that's gonna be a major concern. And then the third thing is the uh, issue of how they would count under the current system as regulatory capital. So I remember Paul Klemper and I talking past John Vickers about this a couple of years ago because the whole idea of earns is to solve the economic problem of a bank running out of money. With, and so if you have payment, you know, payment at a time conversion, but you know that as long as the stock is staying down, that there's gonna be continued conversion, you don't have to worry about the bank having to, the bank's never gonna go broke because of its earns obligation. But if you're thinking in terms of a regulatory capital system, and the bank doesn't convert the whole bond, and you count the remaining bond outstanding as a debt, then you haven't created any regulatory capital in terms of the regulatory system. And so I think the fact that uh, you know, people in the regulatory world are so immersed in the regulatory accounting um, uh, would be a, an issue that would have to be overcome. Uh, unfortunately, the discussant, Charles Colmiris, uh, was unable to make it, so uh, we're lucky that Mariam is going to step in and, and cover his remarks that he was generous enough to provide us with. Um, so good luck, Mariam. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I definitely need that. All right, perfect. So um, let me apologize in advance to both Jeremy and Richard. I'm not an expert on this. They are both experts. I'm sure they both have great views on this. And I won't be able to do justice neither to the paper pre just presented nor to the discussion. So, And every error, if you heard something that you wouldn't hear Richard saying, that's definitely a miscommunication. I just talked to him 20 minutes. and. I'm just reflecting that, so again, I apologize. All right. Oh, that doesn't work, okay. All right, so um, what I'll talk about is um, first why Richard thinks earned are uh, a clever idea and they dominate both the status quo of, uh, of regulation as well as some of the proposed bailing bonds. 
um, then um, Richard would like to think about whether actually earns are the best way to perform these uh, bank capital structures and avoid these issues of insolvency, and, uh, and he's not sure. <laughs> then uh, I'm going to do a little overview of an, another policy proposal that Richard has in, uh, his, in his 2013 paper, which is a, a, a different uh, kind of cocos and how it kind of compares to this paper and then uh, a few other points. All right. So why are earned such clever ideas? Well, uh, the prob what is the problem with the current system? It's that it doesn't lean against the systemic risk. So banks would have to, in some sense, issue equity at the time that it's worse for them. Nobody would be able to, would be happy to, uh, to take on and get the equity, so they're going to be in trouble. And the issue is that uh, book value of banks, is, so when does this crisis happen? When the market value of the assets is much, much lower than the book value of the assets, and the short-term bondholders are not happy to roll over the, uh, the bonds. So why would this book value, uh, and why is this book value problematic? Uh, for uh, two different reasons. One is that people pay too much attention. To, I mean, people are too obsessed with the cash flows which come actually from tangible assets. While uh, Richard believes that um, um, a lot of uh, the cash flow, Charles believes that a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of the cash flows of uh, the bank actually come from some intangible assets. Um, and second, uh, that some of these assets might be uh, misvalued, their value might not be correctly reflected. So what's good about earns is that they reduce this leverage automatically because as uh, the, uh, price, the share prices fall, um, uh, they convert and some equity is issued uh, uh, over time, which basically, as uh, Jeremy argued, each kind of each one dollar new equity issued basically buys the relaxes the bank's uh, uh, constraint by at least one dollar. So that's good for the equity holders too. So it does not have the usual dilution effect of buying, of issuing new e equity. And what's the problem with the bailing cocos is that at least the current, the bailing cocos become effective at an extremely low threshold. So that's the threshold where bank is already in trouble, super close to insolvency. So the, basically the bank would not have any option to uh, issue new securities to solve its balance sheet problems. That's already way, way too late for the bank to step in. Um, so this graph is supposed to basically give you an idea of the fact that a lot of cash flows of the banks do not actually come from their tangible assets. So on the y-axis is a market to uh, book equity. So you can see that a lot of banks have, and this is on different quantiles of the banks, uh, of the book to market to book uh, value, basically. And you can see that you, ha you can see book, uh, market to book values of around four. What does that mean? That means a lot of cash flow doesn't come from the tangible assets. And you can see much lower below one, which means basically either bank has taken losses, which are not reflected uh, in, in its assets, or there are some, the bank is supposed to make payments, which are not, uh, ex and they're not, there are no expected cash flows in the future, which are supposed to cover for them. So uh, the market value is going to take on those effective losses. All right, now let me give Charles views of what are some of the <laughs> shortcomings of the earns. Um, so um, the one problem is that uh, Charles is worried that the earns are not able to ensure that the market value of, e the ratio of this market value of uh, equity to, uh, to market value of assets responds quickly enough when an adverse shock happens. And uh, he kind of believes that this is, at least in the current version of the paper, there is not a lot of argument made uh, that ensures that, these, uh, that uh, the, the, issue, the issuing of earns, given that they're very, very gradual, uh, can ensure a, a prompt answer to large losses. And 
and basically the, the second point is exactly the same thing, that these, uh, this response is gradual, and maybe it's way too gradual. And uh, the other problem is that issuing urns is voluntarily. And it's unclear, at least apparently from the current version of the paper, what would ensure that uh, the banks are going to issue voluntarily these urns uh, at, uh, properly at correct triggers. And that by, by assessing these correct triggers, they can accumulate sufficient equity before actually hitting some boundary of default. And um, OK, so um, what, would, what would have prevented the crisis? Let's think about that. The crisis was not something that happened overnight. There were a lot of losses being uh, accumulated over time. The problem was that they were not correctly reflected. Um, so, for instance, uh, for CD banks, like 11.8% of their, uh, their, uh, their value was declining very, very quickly, the value of their equity. But at the same time, even in the build-up to the crisis, there were a lot of uh, moments of calmness where banks could actually raise capital. For instance, winter of 2007 or, uh, or between April and August of 2008. And the equity markets were arguably pretty open to the banks. For instance, total banks raised about 450 uh, billion uh, in equity uh, before September 2008, but for some reason they decided to stop and don't raise any more. Uh, and why, when uh, when he talks to uh, bankers, what was the reason? The reason was this dilution effect that banks were worried that their current equity holders would be unhappy and diluted. So uh, let me just show this one picture, which exactly says the same thing, that this is the market cap to quasi-market value, which is the value of equity plus total value of debt. And this is a 90-day rolling uh, window. So every point basically reflects 90 days prior. And you can see that once the, this, market, this kind of market to book value uh, fell below 4%, which said is problematic, a few months before that, there's all of them kind of go pretty quickly down. So there's a threshold, let's say 10%, that you can trigger if banks knew that something terrible would happen at 10%, they have to do something very much against themselves. Once they get there, they would try to avoid that very bad event. So we, would, we might never actually get to this problem, OK? And that's what Charles uh, and basically the uh, other kind of relevant proposal that Charles has um, tries to uh, make this mechanism effective, which is to have a minimum uninsured cocos that they will, uh, all of the cocoa, the interest plus the principal, they will all convert at some very, very high uh, threshold. So there is going to be a high trigger, let's say 10%, and everything would convert and it would be diluted. So the, the uh, bank managers are going to hate this. So they would never, ever let the bank kind of go below 10%. And this is kind of uh, some numbers that they have in mind. The goal is, of course, to have prompt capitalization before hitting that boundary. And when banks can actually issue securities, they should issue them. He thinks a minimum amount of cocoa should be about 10% of the asset or 15% of the risk-weighted assets. And the uh, trigger, basically, market to uh, book value should be about 10% uh, uh, or 90% of the market asset. And then the conversion ratio would be about 5% dilutive. And this is something that the banks would completely hate. And this last point, um, again, I haven't read either of the papers, so I don't want to hope but, uh Charles wanted to point out that some of the, he thinks some of the criticisms uh, that are in some of the footnotes of this paper about his paper are not exactly to the point. So some of them uh, are can be prevented by his proposal. Or uh, and let me not do too much on this because <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> okay. It's it's un unseemly to be, uh, for me to be too critical of him, given that he's not here. Uh, so I'll, I'll focus just on a couple of points uh, that he made um, uh, uh, related to our uh, to our paper, and then, then throw it open to uh, uh, questions. Um, 
he raised the point of uh, you know issuing urns is voluntary. How do you make sure that enough uh, uh, get issued? Well, you know, the, our, our vision of our uh, the system is something like this. You know, let's say you have a bank, your bank, and you've got whole loans, and you have to go out and finance them in, in, in the market. And what you can finance them with is collateralized loans plus plus earns plus equity. You know, those whole loans, you could probably only borrow, I don't know, 50 cents, 60 cents on the dollar against them, maybe 70 cents, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, the rest of it, you've got to finance with um, earns or equity. You could, if you want to, if you want to do all equity, that's fine. Then you won't have any earns. That's that's a market uh, uh, a choice. Um, you know, I think um, an important thing about earns, a system where you have have earns, is that um, you get a self-repairing balance sheet. So what happens is when things go bad, the stock starts to go down. You gradually have these conversions, and that automatically you know, restores uh, equity. So the equity comes about passively, whereas in the current system, you have to actually get the banks to go out and sell equity, which we know that they will resist. The only time I can remember banks going out and voluntarily issuing equity in the last, you know, 10 or 15 years or whatever, was after TARP, when in the wake of TARP, banks you know, we're so eager to get out of TARP so that they, the, you know, so that the executives could again have control over their own bonuses that they were even willing to issue equity uh, to do that. But otherwise, you know, very, very uh, 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 tough. I agree with his slide where he says banks could have raised more capital in 2007, 2008. That's for sure. Even at the time of Lehman Brothers, um, the market value, or the week after Lehman Brothers, the market value of Citigroup was something like, what was it, Jacob, $80 billion? So it was down from its peak of 275, but it was still 80 billion. They could have at least raised that. They should have been raising money all along at, at a much greater extent than they were. Um, you know, uh, basically, what Vera Lacharya will say is that they raised the amount that they had to take in regulatory capital losses, which was, you know, $450 billion sounds like a lot, but it was nothing relative to the losses that they actually uh, had. And they would have been kicking and screaming if, if they had to uh, issue stock or if they had earns converting and they, they said, ah, you know, the stupid stock market has been forcing us to issue all this equity and so forth. And it, it, isn't that awful, but, uh, um, you know, uh, the response is, um, you know, uh, what if, you know, maybe the market's too high, maybe the market's too low. Jacob says regulators have to be able to see around corners, be able to cover issues that may, 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 may be unlikely but might cause a problem. One of those possible issues might be that maybe the market's right or even optimistic. I mean, after all, there are as many buyers as sellers at any given point. And, um, uh, you know, having a system which would have caused them to sell much more equity on the way down or passively convert much more equity on the way down, I think passive is an important piece. Why don't I stop there? Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for the discussion, Mariam. Thanks for joining for the replies. Let's open it up for general questions, if there are any from the floor. There is a question over there. Uh, thank you. Um, interesting proposal. I wondered if you had any views on the um, uh, Basel TLAC proposal and or TLAC uh, a proposed rule and the uh, Fed's interpretation of it, long-term debt issuance of the back holding company that's convertible in resolution. Sorry, the what? Sorry? Uh, uh, I, the Basel TLAC proposal and what? TLAC proposal and the, and the long-term debt issuance requirement for bank holding companies that the Fed's just put out a notice of proposed rulemaking on. 
and it, it seems to me that you could argue that um, with some problems, those are addressing, they're addressing a parallel, uh, some difficulties, they're addressing a parallel problem. How much would earns add to what we would have uh, if um, TLAC and long-term debt issuances work well? For sure, for sure the stuff that's been done since 2008 has been an improvement. I mean, Mark, you know, Mark Carney says that we've increased capital requirements on big banks by a factor of seven. Um, it doesn't show up in the market in the sense that the betas and the sigmas of the stock, the bank stocks are sort of what they were in 2007. But, you know, for sure those things have, have been improvements. But, you know, my great frustration with, you know, Basel III is, you know, th think about that, that one slide of data I, I had up there. To me, the biggest, the biggest sin was that we didn't use the market to determine asset values, and we didn't use the market to determine the appropriate haircuts. And Basel III and the stress test explicitly do not use the market to determine haircuts and stress tests. So I think in some ways they're missing to what to me is the biggest piece. And if they had that piece, then they could eliminate many thousands of other pages of stuff. I do. Maybe we have time for one more question. So Alan, right here. I had two, but I'll just I'll ration myself to one. Um, it's a simple question, which is, what, which banks would be subject to this requirement if it's going to be a requirement at all? It could just make it optional. Uh, what I'm thinking about is uh, smallish banks. I don't mean minute banks, but smallish banks that have stock, have relatively little stock out there, and you use the word manipulable at the beginning as an as an asset, as an advantage of your approach, mightn't that be manipulable for modest-sized banks? Well, you know, what we'd say with uh, small banks are basically financed with deposits and, you know, whatever retained earnings uh, they have. They're not part of the market system in terms of raising uh, capital. Um, you know, we would apply the same requirements to them in terms of collateralization of their, uh, you know, of their guaranteed deposits as we'd apply, uh, uh, you know, to big banks and that, you know, I think would effectively force them to raise a lot more capital. Um, to the extent that, it, it, you know, it is credible that they will be allowed to fail, uh, we wouldn't require them to issue earns in lieu of, um, uh, in, instead of uh, uh, instead of other kinds of securities, yeah. So CIFIs would have to CIFIs would have to issue earns. Um, I actually think the fact that we have so I, I actually like big banks in the following way. I think the fact that big banks have access to big liquid capital markets where they can you know raise money and issue securities that's a feature rather than a bug. I think it's a problem that we have all all kinds of small banks that basically rely entirely on their government guarantee for their uh, uh, financing. So I'm, I'm more of a big bank guy rather than a small bank guy. And I, I say that getting no consulting money from any of them. 